And so here we are at the sixth of the talks of our series that we've been going through these last few weeks together on the topic of worship. But we've come quite a way in that as we looked at uh, the various purposes that God prepared in advance for us to do. And this one today of worship is the last in this series, but they've all been driven by the year verse. From Ephesians 2.22, in him you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That verse alone came out of the three month sabbatical I had last summer, when I did nothing but read in great detail Paul's letters to the various churches a historical moment in the history of the church in that the letters we have from Paul were all written before the Gospels and so we get an insight into the early church of how did that early church thrive and we know it thrived because well we're here how did it thrive well one of the or two maybe of the primary things that I, I came to re-realize from that sabbatical was that those early churches had to know who Jesus was. They had to be grateful and thankful for the love that he'd shown them in coming to live on this earth for the period of time, to accept the cost of all of our sin by dying on the cross, to giving us hope for the future in his resurrection, that sin is dealt with, and of his ascension to heaven, that we have a place in God's kingdom when we too come to the end of our lives. So recognising who Jesus is and, and being grateful for that and acknowledging that and, and asking him to be part of our lives is crucial for every church ever since Paul set foot across the very first doorstep of one. But the presence and the acceptance of the Holy Spirit was also crucial. And this series as we've gone through has, has been looking much closer at the connectiveness of that in each of the purposes of how we need the Holy Spirit to be a, a grown disciple. We need the Holy Spirit to minister to each other. We need the Holy Spirit to form fellowship together. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to share some of the passion and the joy that we have from knowing who Jesus is. Which is why the year verse became important. In him you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. A church needs the Holy Spirit. And so this week, the final part of our six part series, we're looking at worship, which is our response. How do we respond to the grace of our Father in heaven? Well, maybe a good place to just begin briefly is, well, what is worship uh, enabled by the Spirit? Well, I mentioned at the very beginning of today's service that it's not about singing. Uh, singing songs in church is a part of worship, but it's not what worship is. So worship is of acknowledging who God is and who we are with our lives. So if I take you back to Mark's gospel, when Jesus was being questioned uh, by some of the folk around him, one of them said to them, I think he was trying to catch him out really, but he said, well, of all the commandments, which is the most important? is Jesus' reply from Mark chapter 12. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The first of the two commandments, of the primary commandments, of what we might call the great commandments is to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and all our strength. That sounds like it's loving him with everything we have, doesn't it? Well, that's not surprising then that Paul uh, writing to the Roman church in uh, chapter 12 of the Roman church, he said, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Our lives are our worship. 
There in Romans 12.1, uh, Paul starts with therefore, I urge you. And the therefore is because of the preceding chapters. So in, in chapter 11, verse 30, he said, just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, dot, 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 therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, to give your lives as a holy sacrifice, as your act of worship. When we're saved from something by someone, we respond with gratitude. If any of us have ever been in a, a life-threatening situation and, and someone saved us, or, or you may not have been one yourself, but you watch maybe one of these TV programs where the emergency services and one goes past, right as I'm speaking, isn't that interesting? Where the emergency services turn up and save someone from a cliff edge or a road accident. Imagine how that feels to have been saved. Well, sometimes it's difficult for us to understand that when we don't know that we're in trouble. But if we discover a life with God, we can see it's almost revealed that actually our life beforehand was not great. And so our response to having been saved is worship. The lovely thing is, is that it's enabled by the Spirit. So a, a couple of chapters earlier in Romans, Paul wrote this in chapter 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Fantastic news. We can be forgiven and once we're forgiven there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because, Paul continues, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. A few verses later in the same chapter, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. There's a big difference between being welcomed as a guest and being adopted as a child. Being welcomed is hospitality. Being adopted means that you are in the line of inheritance of the one who's adopting you. You are a fully fledged member of the family that can't be revoked. All of us are born into families and whether they're great families or they're a bit dysfunctional or for some of us they've not been great experiences. But imagine a beautiful family where your father will do anything for you. Well as we invite Jesus into our lives we're adopted into his family. That's why we can't easily leave it. We can walk away we can forget. But the story of the parable of the prodigal son, of, of the father who sees the son returning, having realised he'd been away and shouldn't have been, and, and knowing that only his father can help him get back out of the misery he's created for himself. We're told in that story that the father sees his son from far off and runs to him and embraces him. The son had set back on that journey with a hope of apologising. But actually, it's interesting when you read it, he never got the chance to. He's embraced by his father. He'd, in his mind, he's apologised before he got there. And our father in heaven knows who we are and how we feel. And his arms are wide and he welcomes us back. And then there's a celebration. It's the celebration of knowing that we're loved by a father who's adopted us into our family. And look, it says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Jesus referred to his father in heaven using this word Abba. It's, it's an Aramaic word. It's, it, it's more formal than daddy, but it's a, it's a familial word. You wouldn't say it to someone who you didn't have a relationship with. And when we, in our prayer life, in our worship times, in 
as we go about our daily life, when we find ourselves just praying quietly maybe to our Father in heaven. Well, we can only do that because we have the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit who enables us to cry, Abba, Father. And so our lives are lives of worship. In the song that we've got coming now, again, I, I've done this most of the weeks, haven't I? I and I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that some people like to just sing a song rather than have it explained to them. But I, I this knowledge of, of how we've come to where we are, of the, of the response that we have, which is of worship, that is echoed in the words of songs, that is echoed in how we feel. Well, I, for me, this, this song helps a lot in that. It's called, Oh, Praise the Name of the Lord Our God. Praise is, is, is in there in the worship, isn't it? I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me, a recognition of the cost of our relationship with our Father. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my saviour on that cursed tree, the one who came to save, to save you and to save me. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone, Messiah, the long-awaited saviour of the world. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. He overcame death, which is where our promise of hope for the future comes. The thought of being able to be in the presence of our Father in Heaven, always and currently sometimes. He shall return in robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Sometimes it's difficult for us, isn't it, to, to imagine what that must be like. But again, it comes from knowing our past to realising where we are now with a beautiful expectation of the future. The Spirit enables that revelation to us which drives our worship, which brings us to the last part of this, the chorus. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. <laughs> 